thank you for joining us for this session. Um, out of curiosity, can I see a show of hands of how many of you are aware of statelessness? Oh, wow, huge crowd. You've come to the right place. <laughs> Christiana, we have several things in common. We're both born in Bavaria, Bavaria, Germany. We're both raised in Germany, yeah. went to school, went to university in Germany. But I'm a citizen of Germany. I have a German passport. You don't. What went wrong? <laughs> Well, um, a few things went wrong. Well, the question is, did it go wrong or was it just categorized in the wrong way? So what happened is, you're correct, I was born in Germany. My parents came to Germany from West Africa. And as they couldn't show sufficient documents, sufficient proof of their identity, I was categorized as a child, as a person with an undetermined nationality, which means as a de facto stateless person. Mm -hmm. So what happened then? I mean, you well, were in limbo, or? Well, what happens is that there are a few challenges, which means that as a stateless person, it starts with you not having access to a birth certificate. So you don't have access to a birth certificate. It is kind of intertwined with the issue of asylum, resident status, and so forth. So you don't have the freedom to travel. You don't have the freedom to do the things that you want to do if it's tied to your nationality, because we live in a world in which the things we want to access are often only access if you have a certain key, and mm -hmm. that key is often your citizenship. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, take us to a moment in your life where you felt the full force of being stateless while traveling. Give us an example. Yeah, so there was this um, very traumatizing incident that also changed a lot about my perspective on statelessness. Um, what happened was that I was planning to travel to Morocco. And before I actually started that trip, I tried to research how am I allowed to travel to Morocco. Because um, in my case, it was like that, that I received the travel document only at the age of 18. So before that, I wasn't allowed to travel at all. So I had that travel document and it said that I would be allowed to travel in, into every country. But it really didn't really, it wasn't really specific as in how I'm allowed to travel to a country. So um, I reached out to the Moroccan embassy. They didn't know what statelessness is. I reached out to the German asylum office. They didn't respond to my messages. So what I did is I compared my situation to a German person because um, the tourist website of Morocco said that German people are allowed to enter the country without a visa. So I traveled to Marrakesh, and when I landed and was at the airport, they confronted me with the fact that I am not allowed to enter the country. So what happened then was that there were a lot of discussions between security guards and so forth. So they kind of escorted me back to the airport gate and explained that I would be forced to stay at the airport and wait until the next flight back to Germany would leave, which was the next day. So I spent 20 hours at the airport gate and waited till the next flight back to a German city, not even my hometown Munich, but another German city, Düsseldorf, um, left. So that was very shocking. Um, I think in that moment I realized that I did all of the things that I thought that I was supposed to do in order to at some point become worthy of a certain nationality, of the German nationality. And in that moment I realized that regardless of whatever I would do, in the end, it always comes back to this fact. In the end, I will always be alone with that statelessness, and there wouldn't be anyone picking me up at that airport and saying, hey, come back home, because this home doesn't really recognize me as somebody that belongs to that place. Yeah. It's, it's home because you were born there, you have friends, you have family, but it's not officially government home yeah. still. Yeah. So how long, or what was the process of coming up with the idea of founding the initiative for State Free? It was a very long process, at least out of my perspective. I'm not that patient. <laughs> and it was also a very hesitant process, and that is simply because statelessness is nothing you like to share with other people. People who were extremely close to me didn't even know that I'm stateless. So it's Including me? Yeah. <laughs> including you. So what happened is that I researched more around statelessness and I understood that there are millions of people. So there's an estimate of up to 15 million people. And even in Germany, we have over 122,000 persons. 
So what I understood that while I felt very isolated with my experience, there are actually a lot of people that are experiencing the same thing. And I thought that they are supposed to be one single source of truth that is able to support those stateless people. And my research journey um, brought me to the fact that there is no single source of truth. So I felt like there should be that one point in which, or that one space in which stateless people can actually come together, share their experience with each other, learn from each other, and get support. So I then gradually shared that idea with a couple of organizations that I actually found. So there are organizations, especially internationally, for me international in the UK, for example, that were working on statelessness, but I as a stateless person didn't even know about it. And as I have more of a business background, I was very confused of, by the fact that you are working on a solution for a group, but you're not even in contact with that group. So how would you even like, develop the solution? So I came to the conclusion that in the end, it maybe has to be me and a group of great people to actually tackle that issue, close the gap between those who are affected by that issue and those who are working on it, and making sure that we find sustainable solutions. And um, did you, from the beginning on, did you plan it to be a non-profit, or how did you go about it to found it, you know, <laughs> and how, how did you start it? Who enabled you to start it? So the thing is, how would you make it profit? <laughs> what we're focusing on is impact, mm -hmm. and I obviously had the understanding that in order to actually achieve impact, you need to have some resources. But I also understood that we won't, get, like, we won't ask people who are affected by statelessness to give us money in order to solve the issue. In the end, this would be or should be the responsibility of a government, which is also not paying us at the moment. So there was no other choice, actually. And it made most sense and felt most authentic also to the vision and the mission. So what happened is that we applied to different fellowships, we applied for different grants and stipends. Mm -hmm. So slowly, we actually also got accepted to those and then understood that there is an interest, even though people never knew what statelessness is. As soon as we educated them on it, they actually joined our mission and were willing to support our mission also. That would have been a question. Um, how many of them kind of bought into the situation that you're into or some that did not acknowledge it? Was there, you know, can you give us a ratio of how many doors you had to knock at to find the right partners to start this off the ground? I have to say, there's a very good ratio. So I think the one barrier that we are facing is we have to be in contact with the person so that we can explain what statelessness is. Mm -hmm. It is a very abstract thing. It's very complex because in the end, like as a child, for example, I didn't understand that I'm stateless because it's super abstract. It's nothing that's it's not on your body. You don't feel it. So you just understand that at some point there is this thing, there's this concept, this legal status, and I don't have it. So speaking to people who, who don't know about statelessness and explaining to them what an issue it is for those who are affected by it, um, it's a challenge. But as soon as we have direct interaction with the person, I have to say the ratio was very high. And almost every door we knocked on actually opened and was then willing to also follow us uh, the rest of the path. Mm -hmm. So I understand that you're focusing on three things, how you want to support um, people that are affected by statelessness. And the first one is the community, because as you said, you didn't know that you were a, a part of a larger group when you found out. Can you share more information on uh, how big the community is, what you're doing yes. in the community? Yes, I'd love to. I think as in how big our community is, in theory, it's that 15 million people, because we see every status person as part of our community, even if they haven't found us yet. So everyone is in our community, and then also we understand our community as a space for those who are affected, but also for those who are allies or want to become allies. So, so far, we started with an online platform, a digital forum, because we understood that we want to be accessible for everyone. So we have a forum slash social network on which people can register and actually get in contact with us, but also get in contact with each other. We launched that platform last year, mm -hmm. but we also understood that there are some barriers, as I, under as I already explained, it's something that you're ashamed of in some instances. So it's not that easy to then just sit in front of your computer and then type into the computer, hey, I'm, I'm this person, I'm based in Lisbon, I'm stateless, I don't have any rights, but also my family, is in the same situation and so forth. So we noticed that we need to actually also directly interact with them in a sense. So it's not only on the digital space, but also in real life. And we have now also started actually getting together in different initiative events, 
bring together status people who are based in Germany, but also some who are based in Europe. And yeah, so that's how our community came together right now. Mm -hmm. And we hope that it's going to grow. Yeah. So what you're saying is by having um, in-person events, you want to lower the barrier that people open up about the issues that they face when they're stateless? Sorry. <laughs> so th th you're augmenting the online community with ah, yeah. offline events yes. to make it easier to lower the barrier for people yeah. to talk about and th the issues they face. Because I would imagine that although statelessness has different things, it depends on which country you're in, yes. which challenge is the most difficult one for you? Can you say that? I think the most difficult one is the lacking sense of belonging. It's not very technical, but regardless of the specific situation you feel, everyone faces this issue of I don't feel like I belong and I feel like I need to do things in order to be worth of belonging. Mm -hmm. Then I think another part is definitely lacking access to school. So there are countries in which you need to have a citizenship in order to actually get education. And that in the end influences the whole path of that person. Mm -hmm. Then the freedom of travel is super hard because on the one hand, you're, it's a situation in which you are forced to stay in the country you're not allowed to leave the country, but then on the other hand, they don't want you to stay. So you're not allowed to travel outside That's of the country. That's a catch-22. <laughs> yeah. So this lacking freedom of travel is something that is a huge issue, but then also this barrier in terms of accessing residence permits. So they don't want you in the country, your identity, your citizenship is not clarified, but then you don't get residency, so you don't get to that path of naturalization. In the end, the only way to get out of statelessness and the way that statelessness is set up currently is through a citizenship. But currently, if we break it down and make it very simple, you need to have a passport to get a passport. So oftentimes the conditions in order to get citizenships is birth certificate, is a passport, all of those things that you don't get in the first place because you're stateless. And then I'd say one of the other issues is definitely that statelessness is inherited. So a stateless person that Gets, bears the child is also in a situation which the child is also stateless. Is that true for every country? I'm, I'm aware that it is in Germany, but is it? Luckily, it's not. <laughs> so there are countries that are developing in the right direction, meaning that they are starting to include stateless people. And mm -hmm. um, so countries such as Spain, they have this principle in which every person that is born in that country also get access to that citizenship. In Germany, it's very limited. I think one of the cases that is probably most yeah, present to people is also the US example of people who are born in the US and then actually have access to US citizenship. Although one also has to say that there are stateless populations in the US as well, because there are people who become stateless at a certain point in time. There have been political conflicts like mm -hmm. former Soviet Union, former Yugoslavia, West Sahara, Palestine, all of those people, they grow up in a certain place. And at some point they understand when they move into another country that they're actually stateless because where they came from is not actually acknowledged as a state. Ah, true, true. So, I mean, one of the most important things is also making statelessness visible. So a lot of people hear about it. How can we do this? Well, um, we live in a world in which visibility is also very much driven by the technology we use. So it's something that doesn't cost much, but it's something that helps us a lot. For one, actually sharing the content we share, following us on the regular social media channels such as LinkedIn and Instagram and Twitter. Um, but then on the other hand, I think, and that's something that we think is even more sustainable, is actually educating your surrounding on statelessness. If we imagine that all of those 70 or 70,000 plus people from Web Summit go home and share it with two other people, how many more people would then know about statelessness? And then they share it with other people because it is something that is almost completely invisible. And then on the other hand, it's something that everyone is interested in because it's so, it's so, like it's not, not easy to grasp for people who do have a nationality that there is a situation in which you are without it. So it is something which you can share at the dinner table, which you can share while networking at this event, and this can help us a lot. Right, but also besides the digital world, to go offline again, like you do with the community and you have events, um, what tools are you using to increase the visibility of um, statelessness? So one tool, in a sense, that we've been using is visual narrative. So we started a project a year ago together with a photographer, an art project, 
because we were very much confronted also with the fact that the way that statelessness is visualized and portrayed is something that we want to challenge and maybe reshape. If we research images of stateless people, it's often a person without a face, a person that only shows their back, it's a shade. So it's always a, a shape of something, but it's never really personal. And it's something that we wanted to stop because in the end, like everyone can become stateless at some point, And there is a huge diversity in the stateless population. So what we did is work together with stateless people across Europe. We, we visited them, we listened to their stories, and we portrayed them in a way that they wanted to be portrayed. We always address them with the, with the goal of making sure that they are portrayed in an empowered way, in a way that they want to be portrayed. And we then concluded all of the portraits we, we collected in our first exhibition this summer in Constance. In Constance. Well, congratula congratulations on this one. Thank you. Okay, the last one to um, support people who um, are affected by statelessness is the equal rights topic. And I hear some voices that you're um, starting to talk with politicians. Yes. What is the most, impress uh, the most important goal that you want to reach in the next, let's say, one to two years, the yeah. impact that you want to make there? So we always said that our mission is to empower stateless people. And we, for that, we started community. We wanted to work on visibility, but we also understood that the only way for stateless people to really be empowered is for them to have access to basic human rights. So we also understood that we need to have a situation in which stateless people can actually participate in the democracy they, li they live in. Stateless people currently, they're not allowed to vote, so they have no political power currently. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to make sure that we are that institution that supports and represents stateless people. Um, specifically in Germany, what we're working on right now is to make sure that there is a path to naturalization at some point. Mm -hmm. But for that, there are certain steps that need to be taken. What are those steps? <laughs> well, <laughs> can you summarize it? <laughs> yeah. So one of the issues we are facing is that we have come to a situation in which there are people that are not only stateless, but also that they're in a situation in which their stateless needs, needs to be recognized by an institution. So what happens is that oftentimes people are in this undetermined category, undetermined nationality, but not recognized as a stateless person. And the only way to actually get naturalized is to get your statelessness recognized. Because that's the situation which the government says, okay, we now know who you are, we now understand that you're stateless, now we will allow you to get out of that statelessness. So we're now trying to close that gap because what people often ask is, how do I get from un undetermined, unknown nationality to stateless? Mm -hmm. Because they're searching for that path, and the problem is they don't find that path because there is none. So what we are trying to do right now is advise politicians on how, to, on how to actually close that gap, how to actually build that bridge so that people at some point can actually end their statelessness and also stop statelessness from being reproduced because children face the same issue as adults do right now. Well, thank you so much for letting us in and all the insights that you have. I wish you much continued success in the future and um, best of luck. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.